Good morning to each and every one of, of us this morning, and I praise and thank the Lord for giving me another opportunity to preach the Word of God. And it is a joy for me to be here once again to see your faces, looking forward to see and to hear God's Word. The theme for this month is Christ in all. My take on this theme is that Christ must not only be in our minds, in our body, in our spirit, in our soul, but Christ must be in all and in everything and in all circumstances. Once we encounter Christ in our lives, we are changed forever. We are changed wholly. We are never the same alone, never ever the same again, and we are never alone anymore. Even in tribulations, hardships, difficulties in life, we are assured that God will always be with us. This morning, I would like to share to you a portion of scripture about a demon-possessed man and how he encountered Christ and Jesus came into his life. And I titled this message this morning as a life-changing encounter with Christ. Let us pause for a moment of prayer. Father, thank you for this time you have given me and the opportunity. I cannot do it by myself, but I want you, O oh Lord, to take full control. Take full control, O oh Lord, for this time. Even, Lord, as I speak your word, I pray that you're going to prepare the hearts of the people who are here, your children, that they will be ready to receive your word. Guide my eyes, my mouth, even, O oh Lord, as I speak forth your word. Give me the strength in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The scripture that was read to us this morning in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, narrates the story of Jesus who had an encounter with a demon-possessed man in the region of Gerasenes. Gerasenes is somewhere in the east shore of the Sea of Galilee. We will look at the story further and discover the changes that happened to the demon-possessed man when Christ, when Christ came into his life. There are many demons, but there is only one devil, Satan. It is important to note here that even demons recognize who Jesus is. And they don't only recognize who Jesus is, but they are afraid and scared of Jesus. In verse 6, it says, Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And in verse 7, it says, They immediately recognized Jesus and shouting from a loud voice he said what business do you have with me Jesus the son of the most high God the devil and the demon demons are afraid of Jesus because they knew what Jesus can do for them before going any further, allow me to divide this portion of scripture into two parts. The first part is about the prayer request of the three characters in the story. While the second part is about the demon-possessed man, how his life was changed when he encountered Jesus in his life. Now let us go first to the first part. 
The first part is about the prayer requests. I have read Mark 5, 1 to 20 many times, but I have realized lately only that there are three prayer requests. And uh, three prayer requests, two prayer requests were answered by Jesus, but the third prayer request was denied by Jesus. Now let's go first to the first prayer request uttered by the demons in verse 12. Let's look at verse 12. And it says, And the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs, so that we may enter them. The demons were earnestly begging Jesus to send them to the swine. Now take note here that the demons are scared to go to hell. Perhaps they would probably choose to go inside the swine than go to hell because they knew how life is so difficult to be in hell. And Jesus graciously answered their prayer. And in verse 13, you will see, Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the pigs and herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. And that was the first prayer request. The second prayer request were uttered by the Jews. When they saw, I mean the Jews, when they saw what happened to the demon-possessed men, they begged, they asked from Jesus to leave the town. In verse 17, it says, And they began to beg him to leave their region. Now, the Jews rejected Jesus. After they saw what happened to the demon-possessed men, they do not want Jesus to be part of their lives. But you know, my friends, Jesus loves us. And Jesus does want to be part of our lives. But you know, Jesus won't force us we have a choice. It's either we want Jesus to be a part of our lives or we don't want him or we can reject him. Unfortunately, the Jews rejected Jesus and they want Jesus to leave the region. They don't want Jesus to be part of their lives. And Jesus graciously also answered their prayer. What did Jesus do immediately without any further questions? Got into the boat and left the region in verse 18. Now the third prayer request was uttered by the demon-possessed man. And what was the prayer of the demon-possessed man? Previously demon-possessed man, he said, he was begging Jesus if he could go with him. Let's look at verse 18, what it says. The, the, the man who had been demon-possessed was begging him that he might accompany him. But what did Jesus say? Jesus denied his request. And instead told him, go home, go to your people, and share to them about Christ, what Christ has done for him, and how Christ had mercy on him. Now, Jesus did not mean to reject the previously demon-possessed man being his disciple, but he wanted that man to be a missionary, to share Christ to his own people, to his own province, to his own hometown. In verse 19, it is read, 
And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And in verse 20, And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. You know, when Jesus comes into our lives, we become so excited. Excited enough that we want to share Christ to others as well. Which is probably why the previously demon-possessed man wanted to go, to, to, to go with Jesus because he wants to preach also. But Jesus denied his request and told him instead he wanted him to share his experience to his family first, to his hometown, and probably those people who have not heard of Jesus in their lives. He wanted his family to know him and accept him as their Savior and Lord as well. Now, my friends, now that we know that we have encountered Christ, Jesus in our lives, we must also share to others, especially our family, about Christ. Now, the second part of the story is about the demon-possessed man. man we have, when he had an encounter with Christ, the encounter resulted into a life-changing experience the moment Jesus came into his life. There are three main things that happened to him when he encountered Christ. Let us read verse 15. And then they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had previously had the legion, and they became frightened. Now, take notice what happened to the previously demon-possessed man. Notice. He was now sitting down, cloth, and he was in his right mind. Let us dissect and study each one of these one by one. First, the demon possessed was seen, that previously demon possessed man, he was sitting down. This represents that Jesus gave him rest and peace. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, Jesus said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The dictionary defines rest as a period of inactivity, relaxation, or also stated to cease motion, work, or activity, especially in order to become refreshed. That's the definition of rest. Rest is a biblical principle. In Genesis 2-2, we see God rested on the seventh day of creation. Why did God need to rest? Notice here, it doesn't say God slept. God rests. He did not sleep. He does not need sleep. Sleep is a human concept that was only created for our earthly bodies. We can therefore conclude that rest doesn't equal sleep. Have you ever encountered sleeping the whole day, the whole night, 10 hours of long sleep? When you woke up, when you wake up, you are still exhausted. It only means 
that sleep is not equal rest, which many of us believe and think. My friends, the number one, the number one way you can find rest is having a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord, and putting our trust in Him. We find rest simply by going to God with our burdens, worries, and pain. Choosing to go to God and spend time with Him, having a relationship with Him, will naturally fill us with rest. The more we grow closer to Him, the more we learn to trust, to lean, to rest on Him, the result we will have less worries and pain and burdens. When Jesus came into the life of the previously demon-possessed man, Jesus gave him rest. My friends, we could also have that rest if we give our lives totally to Jesus Christ. Secondly, Jesus gave the man also peace. In Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, all comprehensions, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When does it happen? The answer is in verse 6. Be anxious of nothing, but in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There are times many unpleasant things happen to our lives. One after the other, trouble after trouble, we, don't, we do not understand and we begin to question God. Sickness after sickness, and we cannot comprehend what has happened. Many people, if not all, are blaming, blaming COVID-19 for what is happening in our lives. Many businesses are shut down. Many people are jobless, and troubles are prohibited, and we blame it. To, 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 to COVID-19. But you know, my friends, the moment, the moment we give everything to God in prayer and give our lives totally to God, God will give us peace that passes, surpasses all understanding and He will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Now take notice, my friends. It's the peace of God. Nothing to do with the peace of this world that God will give. But peace that characterizes God and begin to characterize you. And people around you will be amazed. When things like sickness, trouble, financial difficulties, or danger like COVID-19 pandemic may be present, peace reassures us that God holds our lives and holds it in His hands. And we can trust that things will work together. When does it happen? when we pray. Even King David, the best king and the greatest king that Israel ever had, when he was in trouble, he found peace in God. In Psalms 4.8, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. 
For you alone, O Lord, make, to, make me to dwell in safety. When David was surrounded by his enemies, he found peace in Psalms 23, 4. Though I walk in the valley of, of, of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. The second thing that happened to the previously demon-possessed man, he was now clothed. The first, he was sitting down. Second now, he was now clothed. The time when he was still demon-possessed, probably, he was naked, going around, running around. But now he is clothed. We are not only physically clothed, but when Jesus comes into our lives, we are spiritually clothed as well. How does God clothe us, clothe us spiritually? First, we are clothed with righteousness. In Romans 3.22 it says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe, for there is no distinction. My friends, we were never righteous, and we will never be righteous. Only God is righteous. But once we believe and accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we become righteous in the sight of God. God sees us now to be righteous because of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. He does not see our filthiness, but God sees Jesus in us. And we are now righteous because of Jesus. Second, we are clothed with the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The moment we ask Christ to come into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. Then we will start, start to see the fruits of the Spirit that lives in us. They say that you can tell if that person is with Jesus in his life when you see to that person the fruit of the Spirit. Third, we are clothed to be saints. In Romans 1, 7, to all who are beloved in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word saint comes from the Greek word hagios, which means consecrated to God, which means you are holy, sacred, and pious. It is almost always used in a plural word, saints. Scripturally speaking, the saints are the body of Christ. We, Christians, the church, all Christians are saints at the same time are called to be saints. In the Bible, everyone who has received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord is a saint. You don't have to die first to be a saint. If you have Jesus Christ in your life, then you are a saint. The previously demon-possessed man has now become a saint. Fourth, we are clothed to be heirs of God and co-heirs 
with Christ. In John 1, 12, But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. In Romans 8, 17, If we are children, then we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If needed, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. According to this verse, we share in the suffering of Christ now and we'll share it in the glory of Christ later as his co-heirs or joint heirs. The term heirs of God emphasizes our relationship to God, our Father. As his children, we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade and kept in heaven. The Greek term translated heirs in Romans 8, 17 refers to those who receive their allotted possession by the right of sonship. In other words, because God has made us his children, we have the full rights to receive his inheritance. We are his beneficiaries. Jesus, the only son and begotten son of God, is the natural heir of God the Father. Christ's inheritance is the whole universe and all things in existence. In Hebrews 1, 2, it says that the Son has been appointed heir of all things. Now, being a co-heir with Christ means that we, as God's adopted children, will share in the inheritance of Jesus. What belongs to Jesus also belongs to us. Christ has given his glory, his riches, and all things. We are as welcoming God's family as Jesus is. We are accepted in the beloved. And all that belongs to, Je to Jesus Christ will also belong to us, the co-heirs, as well. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, We are no longer, you are no longer slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. My friends, try to imagine. Think of all that means. Try to imagine everything I have told you. Imagine how things, how great these things I have just mentioned. Everything that God owns also belong to us as well because we belong to him. Our inheritance, our eternal inheritance as well as co-heir with Christ is the result of the amazing grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, In Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. God took us. He took us as poor orphans in this world and made us part of his family through faith in Jesus Christ. He showered us with blessings and promised us eternal inheritance based on the worthiness of Christ himself. The previously demon-possessed man is an heir of God and co-heir of Jesus, just like us, those who have received Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. The third and last thing that happened to the previously demon possessed, now he is now in his right mind. 
The sole part in the human being involves the identity, the will, the personality, the feelings, the emotions, the intellect, and importantly, not all people would know that the soul is the seat and the dwelling place for evil, your sinful nature and evil spirit. But when Jesus comes into our lives, we become a new person. We become a new creation. Just like the demon-possessed man, when Jesus came into his life, he became a new creation. All things have passed away and new things have come. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. My friends, let me end this sermon this morning with a story that happened in the 17th century England. There was a man, a farmer, who wanted to have a water buffalo to help him till the land. But he did not have enough money to buy. So he worked for it, saved it, labored, and many for many years trying to save the money. And then the time came when he had enough. He went to the store to buy the water buffalo, only to find out the owner of the store tells him that the money he saved is now obsolete because the currency has been changed. He became very furious and devastated, and he sought a consultation, an audience with the king of England. And the king was there, and he told the king, You know, O king, I worked for it. I labored for it. Now you are telling me that my money is useless, is futile. And the king compassionately told him, My son, that is true. Your money is obsolete. It has been changed. But he told the farmer, as king of England, I am going to give you a water buffalo for free. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to pay for it. It's given for free. In the same manner, God, the king of all kings, the lord of all lords, gave us Jesus Christ for free. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to labor for it. We don't have to sacrifice ourselves for it. All we have to do is just believe and accept Him as your Savior and Lord by faith. And once we do it, just like the previously demon-possessed man, we will find ourselves receiving rest and peace from Christ, clothed in righteousness, having the fruits of the Spirit and being called saints, becoming heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus and turning into a new creation in Christ. Amen and amen. Let's bow our heads. At this time, let's close our eyes and talk to Jesus. Let us ask him to be part in all aspects of our lives. Let us claim Philippians 4, 7 and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehensions will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My friends, this pandemic has caused us to panic and worry. 
It has disrupted our work and family activities. In the hospital, the frontliners are also worried. We also panic. Just imagine, in one day, 21 positive COVID-19. Just in one day, cases are rising once again. And it has spread to hospitals are being filled again. Private hospitals are having COVID-19 too. We are afraid to go to the hospitals. We are afraid to go to clinics. But let us claim Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehensions will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. When does it happen? When we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your peace. When trouble, we panic. We are scared. Lord, give us peace and rest. In spite of this trouble, in spite of COVID-19, oh Lord, We know that you are with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And the peace of God will cover us that surpasses all understanding. Lord, we pray for each one of the people who are here. It is prohibited for those with comorbidities to get exposed, for children to come to church because of COVID-19. Oh God, I pray, we seek your face. David, when he was in trouble, he sought peace. And he said in Psalms 23, 4, yet though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with him. We pray the same prayer with David, Lord. Though we walk in the valley of shadow of death, COVID-19 is deadly. But we will not fear because we have Christ in us, in our lives. Be with each one of us, O oh God. Answer our prayers. Touch those who are not feeling well, who are sick. Give them the strength, O oh Lord, to stand up. And we thank thee, O oh God, for the answers to our prayers. And we give thee back the honor and the glory which only belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.